first speaker today is Matt Thornhill, founder and managing partner of the Institute for Tomorrow, a nationally renowned think tank headquartered right here in Richmond, Virginia. They study trends impacting the future for organizations and the people shaping those trends with special focus on baby boomers. Matt and his firm have provided consulting and research services to Walmart, Google, P&G, State Farm, the Social Security Administration, and a wide range of senior living organizations, including Leading Age Virginia, Ingleside Communities in Northern Virginia, and Christian Living Communities in Denver, Colorado. He's spoken here before and at national and state events for a wide range of senior living, healthcare, and nursing organizations. You may have seen Matt in the media talking about what's next for boomers as he's appeared on NBC Nightly News, CBS Evening News, CNBC, and in stories in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and others. Today, Matt is going to help us frame the future, focusing on what we need to do today to win tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming Matt Thornhill. Good morning. You know, driving in here this morning, first off, I was grateful I was driving in here this morning and I wasn't heading to the airport to go fly someplace to give a presentation. So driving in here this morning, I drove by the Hermitage just down the street. And it reminded me of a man I met there a few years ago and just hearing that video talking about how residents here are using the internet. So I used to write a column about boomers for the Richmond Times Dispatch. About once a month would write a column. And I wrote one once about how boomers in their 50s really needed to think and plan ahead for the rest of their lives. And I got an email from a 99-year-old resident of the Hermitage named Joe. He's like, Matt, I read your article. I'm like, hey, this guy emailed me at 99? This is remarkable. So I called him. Well, I emailed back and got a response to find a time to call him. And he basically said, I don't actually send the emails. I get the staff to send the emails to them <laughs> using technology. But I went and interviewed Joe and wrote an article about him. His wife had died when they were both in their mid-80s. And when he was 90, he started touring the world on container ships. Container ships will allow for a resident or two, a, you know, a, a customer, to go with them. And he went all over the world. And he did it till he was about 95, and he fell and broke a hip. And then he stopped doing it. But one of the questions I asked him for the interview was, I said, Joe, what gets you up in the morning? What, what do you look forward to? And he laughed. He said, come on, I'm 99. <laughs> but he said, what I am looking forward to is I want to at least get that tick mark. I want to make it to October. I want to be 100. And that was what was motivating him at that stage of life. It's interesting because that's what we're going to talk about today as we talk about boomers thinking about this next stage of life and what role we need to play, those of us in the senior living and senior care industries need to be thinking about. Okay, so what my firm does, as I said, we help people understand the trends that matter for their category or industry and the people who are shaping those trends. And we've done a lot of work, as Gail said, in the senior living category and the senior care category. And everyone's pretty excited about this opportunity. We've been talking about it for 15 years you know, this longevity economy, it's coming at us, it looks pretty significant. What's driving it is demographics. The demographics are destiny. Here in America, we're going to go from about almost 50 million people over 65 to 73 million between now and 2030. That's a huge change. And that gets everybody excited. How are we going to make money off of these old people, right? <laughs> yeah, where do we keep all our old people today? Florida, right? We store them in Florida. Right now, in Florida, one in five people, one in five people walking around are over 65. Well, guess what? It's going to be that way here in central Virginia. One in five people are going to be over 65. We're going to go from almost 200,000 people over 65 to almost 300,000 people over 65 in just the next 11 plus years. That's a significant change. 
So that's a significant opportunity. You talk to people about that and they, their eyes get big because they realize that that's an opportunity. It's also going to create problems for us. Problems for us because we're going to have 90,000 more people over the age of 65 in just a short amount of time. So we've got to get ready. We've got to get ready for that future. And the, the issue is, as this future comes to us, this age wave that's coming at us, is it going to crash over us or are we going to surf on top of it? That's really the question we have to answer. Are we going to be able to manage our way through this? Because once we get to this new normal of having more older people, we're always going to have a big number of older people. Demographics have changed. So this is the big shift that we're going to see happen over the next dozen years or so. So what I want to do this morning is share with you a couple of things. I want to talk to you about where we are today, where we need to be tomorrow, and how we need to be thinking beyond. Those of us who are in the senior living and senior care industry. So you with me so far? Okay, so today, there are things that are pushing this, this category forward, like demographics. There are things that are holding it back. So let's talk about both of those. And those of you who are in the category know this. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. The things that are propelling us forward are the numbers. We're going to have more people over 65. It's going to grow by 50%. So if you do nothing different, nothing different at all in your business or, your, or your, how you care for people, you're going to have 50% more clients. It's just natural. It's just going to happen naturally. So that's a huge opportunity. Another thing that's going to happen is we're going to have more people who need more care because more Americans have chronic conditions and more Americans can live longer with chronic conditions than they ever could before thanks to advances in medicine. It used to be if you got two or three chronic conditions, they conspired to kill you and now you can manage them. So they need care for a longer period of time. The third thing propelling us forward is, is unfortunately Alzheimer's and dementia because as we live longer, we're much more likely to have that happen to us. People 85 and older have a 50% chance of getting Alzheimer's or dementia. According to the Alzheimer's Association, we're going to have about 40% more cases of Alzheimer's and dementia in the future. They're going to need care. They're going to need care. So that's a big opportunity in the category. And the last thing is we don't have them enough short, uh, we don't have enough family caregivers. The first level of care are family caregivers, and the silent generation, our, our parents' generation, more of them got married, more of them are still married, and they had, on typically, four babies. They had the baby boom. So they've got family caregivers there. The next generation, us boomers, less, fewer of us got married, fewer of us are still married, and we didn't have as many children, and the children may or may not live anywhere near us. So we're going to need care. So those are all the things that are going to happen help propel this category forward. What's going to hold us back? What are the, tail, the headwinds? Well, the headwinds are, quite honestly, we've got a whole category, a whole segment, a whole cohort, the boomers, who don't have money. Who don't have money. Now, there's 75 million boomers, and about a third of them have enough money for retirement. About a third of them, it's a 50-50 chance whether or not they're going to be successful in retirement, be able to fund it. And about a third who have nothing saved for retirement. Although this morning at breakfast, I heard the numbers a little bit better. It's only one in four have zero saved for retirement. That's still 17, 18 million people. That's a problem. In a study we saw last year, 54% of, of boomers said, I don't have enough money for retirement. And only 32% had saved more than $100,000. So if they don't have the resources to fund their life when they're no longer working, who's going to take care of them? And what's the pressure going to happen? What pressure is going to be put on those of us who have it versus those who are the have-nots? Who's going to take care of us? So that's going to be an issue for the category to deal with. Trend two is that, that people don't want to come and live in a senior living facility. They want to grow old at home. Even if they have a debilitating condition, nine out of ten boomers say, I'm not going there. I'm going to stay in my place. And now they can stay in their place. There's a whole new category of services that have been developed to enable people to stay in their home longer and not come to a senior living facility or a life plan community or any of those things. And whether it's the, the services in the home or the ability to build a bungalow or a granny flat, they're called, on your property to house your elderly relative so they don't have to move into a community, or the technology that allows you to kind of drop in and stay connected without having them have to go anywhere. And the big driver that used to drive people into senior living was, well, I can't drive anymore. Well, now I got Uber driving, and in the future, I got, I got Google driving me around in a driverless car. 
So those are the things that are going to hold us back, if you will. So we have the, the fourth thing that's going to hold us back is that this category is, is just ripe for, for disruption. It's just ready for somebody to change. Everybody I talk to in senior living says, we've got to expand or we're going to be acquired. They're, they're thinking about their business platform. We've got to innovate, we have to reinvent ourselves, or we're stuck. So we see people looking at this category and saying, there's opportunity here that's going to really cause disruption. So those are the issues that are propelling us forward. Those are the issues holding us back. That's where we are today. What's tomorrow look like? Well, tomorrow is going to be different. Tomorrow is, I call it, business unusual. If you still operate the same way you did five years ago or ten years ago, you're already behind. You've got to move forward to, to what it's going to be in the future. So let's talk about that. As I said, many organizations out there, many businesses out there, see this as an opportunity area. They're not standing still. And this category, we say, is kind of, you know, they read the books. They know what's going to happen. We think that this category has the opportunity of being blockbustered. You know, it's a verb now. Are you going to get blockbustered? Are you going to be be disrupted. You know, Blockbuster as an industry, as a category, was a very successful distributor of, of video, right? Retail distributor of video. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, they had an opportunity to buy this little startup called Netflix for $50 million. And they said, we're not, we're not, we're not doing mail DVDs. We're a retail distributor of video. How'd that work out for them? Right? What's the market value of Blockbuster today? Zero. What's the market value of Netflix? I looked yesterday, bad market yesterday, but it was $135 billion. Disruption. So I look at this category, we look at this category and say, wait a second, life plan communities are all about promoting safety, planning, and insurance. But is that your Blockbuster? Is that the wrong offer? Because the question you have to ask is, is that what boomers want? And the answer is no. That's what the last generation wanted, and that's what you developed and sold. But that's not what the next generation wants. You're not going to win the game. You're not going to win tomorrow if you're talking about safety, planning, and insurance. Those aren't the triggers. Used to be the triggers, not the triggers anymore. So, what are the triggers? What are the things we... And I tell you, we see new concepts showing up everywhere. The naturally occurring retirement community, NORCs they're called, caring collaboratives, co-housing, virtual villages, families of convenience. Have you heard about elder orphans? These are older adults who have no help. They don't have a spouse, they don't have kids. They're orphans. They've kind of developed their own family of convenience to to help them. Wellness communities, you know... um, Wellness communities are going to be a big category. There's a development just south of Atlanta, south of Peachtree City, called uh, Serenby. They took an old farm and they've converted it to a community. It's multi-generational and it's wellness-based. And guess who lives there? Everybody. All ages. But a lot of boomers are moving there because it speaks to them. It addresses what they want. Um, You talk about co-housing. Co-housing is a concept that came from northern Europe. It's basically like... uh, Build a, uh, an area where you have five or six houses and everybody owns them together. Sounds like a foreign concept. We've had them in Virginia since 2006. There's 20 plus co-housing developments. There's one being developed here in Richmond over in uh, west, eastern Henrico. So there's new concepts are everywhere. People are developing stuff. So it means that we as an industry need to be thinking about, well, what do we need to be developing? How do we get outside of our walls? How do we provide the services that the community needs? Because new models and approaches are being developed every day. Every time we turn around, there's somebody has got a new concept coming out. You know, <coughs> is it going to be the Golden Girls model? And the answer is, that was ahead of its time. But that's the future. These boomers who don't have spouses and don't have kids nearby are going to join together and say, you know what? I call it the BFF model. My best friends from ever. Let's all get together. And every time I've talked to people I know around the country about this, they go, Matt, I've already talked to my friends about this. We're going to do this. We're going to get together and buy a house. Guess what? They can't. Because whose name can go on the the title? Married people or maybe two adults. Not all five. We're going to have to change the laws. We're going to have to change the rules. Because this is a model we're going to see developed out there. 
This is an article about a, an elder, a solo elder, an elder orphan as they're called. And she moved from Philadelphia down to Tarboro, North Carolina, where it's a low, low cost of living. And she put together her family of convenience, her church. She met the neighbors before she bought the house. She said, I'm going to move in here as a single older woman. Can you help me? She, she met the people that run the funeral home, the lawyer, the baker in town, all the people that she thought that she needed to have to form a network before she made the decision to buy the house and move down there. But she's put it together all by herself. We're going to see people doing that, solving the problem themselves. There's uh, Dr. Bill Thomas, who started the Eden Alternative concept 20-some years ago in senior living, has now got the Minka concept, and it's basically modular homes he's going to build in a factory and go install on, on properties for communities, kind of tiny home, if you will, for seniors. And then here, you know, we saw a statistic and said, this is an opportunity. We don't hear anybody talking about it, but we see it as an opportunity. But Moody's projects that 800 small colleges are going to close by 2030. We didn't make enough young people. There's not going to be enough population to fill those colleges, so they're going to close. What's going to happen to those facilities? I don't know about you, but I'm thinking about investing because I think there'll be 800 dorm-based senior housing facilities that are going to take over some of those empty college dorms. And us boomers, more of us went to college than before, are going to want to go back and live in that environment. Think back to the early 70s and, and uh, really the late 60s, early 70s, when women went into the workforce, churches saw that as an opportunity to take advantage of their facilities and said, you know what, let's provide preschool services for these moms that have to go work. Well, those facilities, too, are going to find a dearth of younger kids to fill the facilities, while around them there's a, this growth of older adults. We're expecting to see church-based senior daycare is going to become the norm. Partnering up with assisted living facilities who might provide the services at the church, the church's bus goes and fetches the people from their home every morning and takes them back home in the afternoon. They've got the buses. So we see opportunities like that all over the place. And then new business. New concepts are popping up all over the place. Go Go Grandparent is an app that goes on top of Uber that uh, is specific Uber drivers that will pick you up and go door to door and can take you with a walker and will wait for you to take you back home from it. You serve as a similar product that they're actually partnering up with governments to provide those services, that last mile of paratransit, if you will. Neighbor Force is, a, is actually a local startup company you may not have heard of. Paige Wilson, the founder, is here. Hi, Paige. I see her in the front. What a great concept. It's basically uh, matching up uh, adults, and typically older adults, who want to provide services to other older adults. And they buy it on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Do I need you to help me go to the grocery store? Can you come over and just make breakfast for me Saturday morning? Can you just help? They don't do the assisted, I mean, uh, activities of daily living, but they do other things. Can you come change a light bulb? You know? Can you take care of things for me? And it matches up uh, pre-screened uh, pre neighbors. You see, labor force, neighbor force, it's a great, great name. It, it pre-screened folks matches them up with the services need. Umbrella is a similar service that's based up in New York City that was started by a millennial who wanted to help out his neighbors and trying to match up people. So we're seeing more and more of these services all over the country. The point is, is if you're not experimenting, partnering, collaborating, joint venturing, cooperating, if you're not doing that, you risk getting run over. You risk getting blockbuster. So that's what we need to be thinking about tomorrow. Now I'll tell you, you don't have to be the first ones out there. Let Paige take the arrows as the pioneer. <laughs> Sorry, Paige. <laughs> You've stuck your neck out, but let's follow along. Let's partner up. Let's see if there's opportunities there for us to kind of turn it into a successful business for ourselves. Now, that's tomorrow. Where do we go beyond? Well, beyond is we've got to realize that the consumer of tomorrow is different. And the question I have for all of us is, do you understand tomorrow's seniors? Because tomorrow's seniors are not the same folks that you've had here in these types of uh, businesses for the last 40 years, basically. We wrote a book about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, about boomers and how they were just a different consumer at 50 and beyond. And I will tell you, they're going to be different at 65 and beyond. They're already changing what it means to be 65. You've probably heard the expression, you know, 65 is the new 45. 
And us boomers look at that and say, no, no, you don't get it. That's not exactly right. What it is is we've made 65 the new 65. It used to be 65 was old. 65 is not old anymore. How do I know that? This guy went and gave a concert. Uh, in, um, he's now 68, by the way. I think he's about to turn 69. But he sold out Broadway from last October to January at 68 years old. Now, if you had told me 30 years ago when he was 38, hey, Matt, when, when Bruce is 68, let's go to a concert, I would have said, are you kidding me? That dude will be old. No, he's not. He's not. There's money in old people. He sold out the whole concert, the entire thing. Now, part of the deal is maybe we're not old at 65. We're not retiring the same rate that the silent generation did when they turned 62. But maybe, we, maybe we're in better health. Maybe we need to work longer. There's all sorts of reasons why we're kind of changing this. But a lot of it has to do with mindset. Now, the prior generation, the silent generation, and that name came from the fact that they were Nixon's silent majority in 1968. It doesn't mean that you're quiet. In fact, you tend to be very vocal, and I'm sure as the folks who run Westminster Canterbury will tell you that their residents have plenty to say. So it has nothing to do with that. But that generation came of age at a time when they got shaped by events that kind of washed over them when they were in their teen years, if you will, that shaped them, things like the Great Depression and World War II, and, and you had to kind of come together and you had to save the tinfoil for the war effort. And you just had to be really uh, pr protective of things. And we end up with a set of generational values that, that shape that generation. They're, they're a generation all about dedication and sacrifice. They have a respect for authority. It was formed quite naturally because the government got us out of the Depression. The, the army got us out of World War II, and you had to follow orders. You had to do what the, what the boss said. And it's interesting, that respect for authority shows up now as they're dealing in, with health care. The, the only opinion they trust is the doctor, not the nurse practitioner, not the physician assistant, the doctor. He's the authority figure. And you think about us boomers, we're not wired the same way. We don't trust the doctor. We come in to see the doctor with our printouts from the Mayo Clinic saying, let me tell you what's wrong with me. You know, we've already figured it out. So this, this generation is very dedicated, dependable, very loyal, very practical, and a little bit compliant, happy to do what's needed for the group. It's not about me, it's for the group, whatever's better for the group, because of what they experienced when they came of age. We say that this is a selfless generation. Now, that's wonderful when we're running a senior living facility, but now here comes another generation that is the opposite of that because they had different experiences growing up. The, um, oh, this is one of the things, Michelle Holleran, she's an expert in this category, she wrote an article not too long ago, says, look, we're already seeing a shift in resident engagement, even though it's the silent generation, the culture has seeped into them, and they do want to have a voice, and their voice is, uh, they want to have input. They want to drive the, the, the bus, if you will. It is about well-being and security for them, it is about purpose and fulfillment now for them, and it's about inclusion and acceptance. They are becoming more tolerant. So there, we are seeing the culture change inside senior living facilities. But now we've got this next generation that's at the doorstep, and they came, they came of age at a different time. All sorts of different events shaped us, leading to a different set of generational values. We talk about millennials being the entitled generation. Ha, ha, ha. We're the entitled generation. <laughs> there were more of us than there were anything else. The whole world had to kind of conform to us. I'll give you an example. Toy. The whole toy category was developed in the 50s because there were so many boomers. Kids cereal was invented for baby boomers. You can thank your lucky charms for baby boomers, literally. But we, we, have, we are, interestingly, one of the things about us is we've been transformational. We looked at how our parents have done stuff and said, we're not doing it that way. The generation gap was a term that was used to describe our relationship with the prior generation. And as, we've, as you think about America from 1946 to America today, look at all the changes that have happened during the boomers' lifetime. Now, boomers didn't lead all of these changes, but they were the foot soldiers that made a lot of these things happen. And now we're at the stage where we're thinking about, well, what's next? It used to be you were done at 65. And now, well, it's just a state of mind. And part of the thing that's happened is that boomers have a different time horizon. When my parents got to age 60 or 65, they looked ahead and said, wow, I'm going to be gone by 75. 
So I better retire at 65, maybe spend five years playing with uh, traveling and, and then playing with the grandkids, and then I'll get the call to the great beyond. And then, thanks to medical advances, for a lot of them, it didn't happen. They got this bonus, this longevity bonus, at the end of their lives. My father-in-law died last year at age 94. And he used to say to me, Matt, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I wouldn't have quit at 65. I've got, you know, I had 30 years. Well, here you go. you got a boomer generation standing here at 60, looking ahead, going, i got 25, i got 30 more years, maybe 40 years. i got lots of treads still. I've got a bonus now. What am I going to do with it? What can I do with it? I'm not interested in senior living and assisted living and life plan. I'll get to that when I'm 85. Why do I need to worry about that? Because you need to plan and you need insurance and you need security. Have boomers ever planned and had insurance and security? No. They'll get to it when they get to it. So you've got a different mindset of this generation heading there. You know, it used to be we were over the hill at 50, right? You get that mailing from AARP, you need the card because you can't make decisions about things very well. You talk to boomers, they go, look, I'm going to peak at 50 and die at 100, and my peak is going to, I'm going to look like this. Boop. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's going to work out that way. I'm just saying that that's what they think. That's the way they view it. But part of the issue with this generation is that they view the world through the lens of what's in this for me? What's in this for me? They're self-centered, not in a self-absorbed way, but really trying to evaluate, what, what am I going to get out of this? And that was formed quite naturally around the kitchen table. We had three or four siblings. We had to vie for mom and dad's attention. I had to get that last cookie, you know? So we were always kind of looking out for ourselves. So when you talk to them about senior living, it's like, well, you know, you're a doctor, you're 65, you should think about where you're going to live in the future. And we've got lots of retired doctors over at Westminster Canterbury. And they look at you and go, well, yeah, but why do I need to go there? I'm, I'm me. I'm not just a doctor who's like all the other doctors. I'm me. You've got to talk to me about my thinking. And we don't do a very good job of that. We need to do a much better job of that. What's in this for me? And we also need to change our thinking. We have this 20 extra years of living. Yes, boomers are not young anymore. We know we're not going to uh, found the fountain of youth, but we want to survive in the fountain of vitality. We want to stay vital until we take our last breath. So any group or association or business that helps us maintain our vitality in any of these five ways is going to win tomorrow. It's going to be successful. It's a positive thing about what's next, not a negative thing. It's not about decay. It's about what's, what the opportunities are. You've got to start preparing for this new future of older boomers. And I will tell you that we've not done a good job making this transition. This transition to this market hasn't happened yet. Again, the market's not ready for you, but you're also not talking to them in a way that they will respond to. I'll give you really the key, the common thread that's going to be there for everyone is the ones who talk to us about our vitality, not engagement, our vitality. What are we doing to stay vital and active? I don't need to be engaged here. I might need to be vital and active elsewhere. Are you helping facilitate that? Are you helping make it that happen? Part of the issue is since about 1965, when Medicare came on the market, we have been focused on as a nation to solve the problems of aging, as if it's a disease we're going to cure. How are we going to do that? I look at this and say, wait a second, let, before I fix this, let's at least talk about the language. The words matter. Words matter. I'm on a personal uh, goal to get us to stop talking about aging. I look at that and say, are you kidding me? Aging is like saying we're breathing. I started aging the day I was born. I know when I'm going to stop, right? It isn't just something that people do over 65. We're always aging. And if you think about that word, we can dress it up. We can put lipstick on that pig and call it reinventing and positive and successful and all of these things, but that, it's all a negative word. The only time aging is good is a bottle of wine. <laughs> right? Maybe some cheese, but that's about it. Yet we talk about, I call it the aging industrial complex. We talk, there are commercials on TV every night it's, uh, about how we're going to solve the problems of aging. Take this pill and you will solve your problem. Problem solution. It's not a problem. 
This is not the issue. It's not, we got to talk about positive things. Like, how about growing older? How about older adults? Older adults, it's a relative term. And growing older is a positive thing, not a negative thing. Oh, how are we going to do, how are we going to fix aging? You're not. We're all going to die. How can I support older adults? That's a different discussion. Now I'm interested. You know, when I mean it's a relative term, I have an older brother. You know how long I've had an older brother? The day I was born. He's always going to be older. It's just a relative term. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not judgmental. It's not saying that we have to fix you because you're older. You just are. It's perfectly fine. And as us boomers get to being older, Bruce Springsteen is older. Is he aging? No. He's still relevant. He's still vital. If you start talking about aging Bruce Springsteen, you just lost. But if you can talk about Bruce Springsteen as an older musician, what is he doing differently? You've won. You've won. So it's not the problems of aging. It's the promise of longer lives. That's what we need to be talking about. That's what we need to be delivering. That's what we need to be facilitating in our communities, in senior living. Because we're going to have twice as, or not twice as many, 50% more people over 65. This is going to be a huge, important segment of our community from this day forward. So let's start talking about the promise of long life. What difference can boomers make from age 65 to 85 before they get to, quote, old age? Huge differences. What are we doing to facilitate it? Let me show you a commercial that captures this idea. It's a commercial from a, a I won't tell you the company until the end, it's from Taiwan. So yes, it's in Chinese, but there are supers and you'll understand what's going on. It's a long form commercial, but let me show you this commercial.
It was for a bank. But the point is unmistakable. What do people live for? Dreams. What was Joe, my 99-year-old friend, living for? He had a dream of living to 100. We can ha- Our culture, from the beginning of time, has welcomed and encouraged young people to have dreams. Go fulfill your dreams. Why can't older people have dreams? Why can't older people have dreams? Um, Ray Kroc franchised McDonald's when he was in his 50s. Um, um, Julia Child won her first Emmy when she was 80. People can have dreams at any age. My question for us in this room, as we're thinking about our future of an older Virginia and an older Richmond, is what are we doing to support the dreams of older people? What a huge resource we have that we are blessed with. People that have wisdom and experience and dreams. Are we talking to them about their dreams? Are we engaging them about their dreams? The winners of tomorrow in this category are going to be the the people that figure out this is what the game is. This is what matters. People have dreams. Let's help them live it. That's the boomer future of senior living. Thank you very much. I'll be back for questions later.